Hi guys and welcome back to the Bird Photography Show with Glenn Bartley. Hello everybody. And me, Jan Wegener. So Glenn, we're used to you wearing your fanny pack basically all the time, but what's going on today? <laughs> well, I'm glad you asked, Jan. Today I'm actually showing off this cotton carrier, which by coincidence is the sponsor of today's episode. This is the cotton carrier sort of camera, or in my case, binocular harness. And it's a product that I've been using for more than 10 years. In fact, if you go back and look at some of my old YouTube videos from literally 10 years ago, you'll see that I initially reviewed this product way back then, and it's still going strong. I find with normal binocular straps hanging off my neck, it's just, at, by the end of the day, it's I got this sort of tension headache and really uncomfortable, whereas the cotton carrier just spreads the weight out nicely. And they have this great system where you can just you know, if you're in the field, you're just doing your thing. And this little piece here just goes straight in, but then once it's in, it, it can't fall out. So it's really nice. It's a great system. It's comfortable. It works. It's worked really well for me. So they're the episode sponsor. And if you're in the market for a, a way of either holding your binoculars, in my case, or your camera, I definitely think you should check them out. And if you want to get a great deal, you can use the code The Bird Photography Show and you get 10% off in the link down there. So Glenn, let's get right into the episode by talking about what you think is missing from Sony currently. And we're obviously going to focus mainly on bird and nature photography. We're not going to get into all the wide angle lenses because I think with the wide angle lenses, especially there's a lot to fill in for all the brands, but we really want to focus on those sort of telephoto lenses. It is the bird photography show after all. I definitely have lens envy as a Canon shooter. I definitely would love if Canon had a 200 to 600 that was comparable to Sony's, I mean, amazing lens and a great price point. Like I would, if Canon had that lens, I would be all over it. So that's awesome. And it's kind of crazy that like, there's been, you know, new releases from Canon and Nikon, but Sony's A1 is kind of still the king as far as camera bodies go, at least for stills anyways. What, like, what do you think, Jan? Yeah, I think there's actually not a lot missing from the lineup, really. I think for nature photographers, it's probably the most complete lineup. You have a 100 to 400, you have a 200 to 600, you have a 2.8 400, you have an f4 600, you have some great video cameras, some great photo cameras. For me, really, the only downside currently with Sony I see when I compare it to Canon and Nikon is that even the A1 doesn't have eye tracking in video mode. So that makes it a lot harder to work with the camera in the field. And the second thing that also makes it harder, especially for video shooting, is that the image stabilization and the combination of the IBIS and the image stabilization is like a clear third place for me when I compare it to Canon and Nikon. So it's actually very difficult to do handheld video with the longer lenses. Like with an R3 and the RF 600mm prime lens from Canon, I can still do handheld video, which is nuts. Wow. Whereas with the A1 and the 200 to 600, it just kind of goes all over the place already. So there's two minor things. And if you just do photography, it probably doesn't show up as much for you. But if you're doing video and photography, then there's definitely some room for improvement. But other than that, I think the lineup is quite complete, really. There's not much that's left to be desired. At least the eye detect in video could potentially be a firmware thing. Because if it has it in stills, like... It seems to me they could probably enable that somehow. So, but I always wonder, like, I don't know, it'd be interesting to be like a fly on the wall in these companies' <laughs> headquarters, secret offices. Like for me, if, if, if Sony's looking at these other people, these other two companies, Canon and Nikon, and they're thinking, okay, like we kind of still have the best camera. They're clearly working on other stuff, but they're not really like in a big rush to get anything to market, you know, to become even further ahead. So they're probably like, I would think they're probably waiting for like the Canon potentially R1 or whatever comes next from Nikon. And then they're like, okay, and then we're gonna try to blow that out of the water and just regain our, our throne. Well, it seems like that that's what the camera brands have been doing because Nikon was long behind for a long time. So I think they had some not so fun meetings probably saying, come on, let's catch up <laughs> yeah. somehow. But then yeah. they brought out the Z9 and I think that's a pretty nice camera, but there's definitely still yeah, a lot of like holes it. in the lineup. Definitely, like you say, the Z9 seems to be a really great camera out of the gate, and then they really improved the firmware, and now it like really looks good, really attractive camera. The only kind of downside I can see with it is like, it's a pretty substantial, heavy, robust body. I think that would be the biggest issue for me if I was currently using Nikon, because I will need at least two, probably three high-end camera bodies, the way I'm filming and working and photographing at the moment. 
So if I had to buy two or three Z9s, that would first of all be quite expensive, but it would also weigh over four kilos if I put all those Z9s in my backpack. Yeah. And then you can't even yeah. really take any lenses anymore when you're flying somewhere. So I think what's really missing is some more high-end mid-level cameras there that can be a good yeah. second body to Z9, for instance. I know there's always rumors about a Z8 that would be kind of like a Z9 minus the built-in battery grip. So I think that would be a great addition to the lineup. But they've done very well with the lenses overall. Well, you know what else is missing, Jan? All those amazing lenses that have been developed and announced by Nikon, but who has them? People waiting six months or even more to get their hands on some of these like fantastic lenses like the 800 PF lens and, and some of these other lenses that have been announced that just sound awesome, but it's like, can you get your hands on one? So they really need to kind of up their game in terms of getting that product out. It's, it's awesome that they're doing such great innovation. And I know that it's not exactly the easiest time to do business right now with supply chain stuff and everything. That's probably one of the biggest draws for Sony at the moment as well, because you can usually go into the shop and you get the gear. If you were switching to Nikon today, you don't know when you would get a Z9 or that 800mm lens. But overall, they've done amazingly well and definitely pushed the envelope when it comes to the lenses, like the 2.8-400 with the built-in 1.4 extender, the 800PF, a great 100-400. to And on the roadmap, there actually is a 200-600mm to 600 millimeter lens that... Mm. If it's anything like the Sony in terms of weight and maybe price, although I don't know if they can get it that cheap, sounds like a fantastic lens that would also sell in like monumental quantities. Yeah, it's like if you're an icon shooter, it's exciting because the company's making good products and they're innovating new and exciting lenses. All right, well, that brings us to Canon. And it was really exciting to see Canon kind of jump out with the R5 and the R6 and R3. And even with the lenses, like they innovated that 100 to 500, which is really an amazing lens that was built from ground up. But ever since in the telephoto sector, we got a lot of adapted and kind of MacGyver kind of lenses where you put yeah. an adapter here, you glue a couple extenders on there. So they have done some stuff, but it didn't feel like truly from the ground up new innovative lenses like Nikon. It would be pretty cool if they came out with like started trying to rival Nikon's PF lenses and came up with some lighter prime lenses like that would be pretty awesome. The other thing that's really missing from the lineup would be an R1 for me. We have so many of sort of lower end or mid-level cameras now. We have like an R10, R7, R5, R6, R3. So there's a lot of cameras now, but there's no flagship. Even though they call the 1DX Mark III a flagship, it's clearly not a flagship camera anymore. And so an R1 is definitely missing. Some of the third party lenses are working or are not working so well with the R series bodies. Maybe you can summarize that, what you just recently talked about on your video there. Well, there's definitely a big sort of uproar because Canon seems to be actively preventing other manufacturers from actually making RF lenses. And I guess from their perspective, it makes sense because why would they want to share the profits with other companies? But I know for a lot of you guys, obviously, having some cheap alternatives from Sigma or Tamron was always quite attractive, but you must say overall native glass generally works the best and works better than adapted third-party glass or third-party glass. And I think what people underestimate at the moment is in the past with a DSLR camera, you bought a lens, you put it on any DSLR camera and it kind of worked. Whereas now there's huge differences between cameras, even from Canon, how they communicate with the same lens. Like my 100 to 500, it's a fantastic lens, but if I put it on an R7, it behaves completely different to when I put it on an R3, for instance. So actually it seems like the communication between the lens and the camera is key now. And this is why it's so difficult for the third party manufacturers to do anything because they can build a lens but I think what's really missing is the software that communicates with the software in the camera. And that's why you see the autofocus sometimes pulsing and you don't get as many sharp images. And you see big sort of jumps and jerks with the image stabilization because I think it just doesn't talk yeah. to the IBIS in the camera. And the only way to circumvent that would be Canon actually kind of sharing the RF mount data. But from Canon's perspective, why would they want to do that? Yeah. Yeah. I saw Dwayne had done a video about the 150 to 600 Sigma on the R7 and it didn't exactly seem all that encouraging performance wise. Like when it hits, it's good. But, you know, what we've come to love about these R series bodies is their consistency. Like mm. 
just night and day from DSLRs with that eye detect just locking on the subject and just, you know, basically every shot in the sequence being in perfect focus. And it's, it's like if you lose that and it's sort of like it, it works, it's almost more frustrating. It's like it works really mm. well sometimes, but then you miss a bunch of shots. You have a lot of RF lenses, yeah. And so what do you think are they kind of worth that higher price point? Like what's your experience with the RF glass with Canon? Well, the first opinion will be unpopular because for me personally, I'd probably pay any price for the 100 to 500 because it has changed my photography life so much and it's mm. a perfect walk around and handheld video lens for me. But that one left aside, I know a lot of people always say that RF glass is very overpriced, but at the same time, I think it delivers in the field. As you say, you get that amazing consistency. You basically have no out of focus images with like an R5 and the yep. 100 to 500. And the other argument I'd say, Canon has tried to make some cheaper lenses for sure. Like you have a $550, 100 to 400 RF. It's wide open at F8, but I use that lens. It's really sharp. It's superb image stabilization. And I just recently got a DM on Instagram from someone who I talked to about lenses and he had the Sigma lens and he just struggled with the image stabilization to focus. And he bought the Canon RF 100 to 400 and he just wrote me a message like, oh God, that's amazing. I had like six out of focus images out of like 500 images that I took. And that was like <laughs> unheard of for him before. So there's, I think there's yep. definitely some high quality, good priced options available as well. Of course, the big glass is very expensive, but I feel like it's worth it in the end as well. All right, well, I think we've talked enough about equipment for this episode, but why don't you guys let us know, did we do a good job here? What do you think is missing from Sony, Nikon, and Canon? Let us know down in the comments. All right, so let's shift gears now from equipment and start talking a little bit about social media. Where are we at these days? I mean, I think a really important question when it comes to social media is, what is it even for, for you? What are you trying to get out of it? Is it, are you trying to learn something about photography? Are you trying to actually get tips and, and you know, learn some new techniques? Are you trying to just have your photos seen by the most people possible? Or are you trying to just go on there and maybe not even post much at all, but just get inspired by other people's work? I think for me, those are the three main kind of aspects of social media. What do you think, Jan? I think that's actually a good point because once you know what you want to get out of it, it also helps you to have like a strategy to get done what you want to get done and also maybe not to be frustrated if you say, I truly just want to share my photos on Instagram, I don't care about likes and the algorithm, then you can do that and you just post once a week and it's fine. But if you say, I want to grow my account like crazy, you'll probably have to post a few times per day and do a lot of videos and reels. So I think it's a great point to actually understand why am I on social media? For me personally, it's all about being seen, sharing my work, connecting with other people and building a community basically. But that's just what I want to do because personally, for instance, I think that websites are more or less kind of dead these days. Like if I want to look up another photographer or hear about this cool new photographer, my first step would be to go to Instagram and look him up. I don't usually go to Google anymore, try to find a website because I'm on my phone a lot as well. And it's much easier to look at stuff on Instagram on your phone than going to some website that might not be optimized for phone. So social media for me is almost like your business card now. Like people see you and then they can connect with you there. Social media is often like the first point of contact. But ultimately, I want people to go to my website. I want people to say, oh, I kind of like this guy's Instagram photos. Oh, let's check out his website. Because there, I can actually curate photos in a larger format. I can actually not have to crop them within the confines of these platforms. I can make different galleries. You just never know with these platforms. Like for a while there, everybody thought Facebook was the, the biggest thing in the world. And now it's like a lot of people don't even go on there. So if I invest my whole kind of artistic license of my photography in one platform and then that platform goes dead, it, or if it changes to something else, I can still point people back to my website. So that's kind of how I look at it. Well, I'm not against websites. You definitely need a website, but I think the website, as you say, it's kind of the second or third step for people. They Yep. find you on social media, they really like you, and then they might go to your website if they want to see something else. Because if you compare the views on your website to your average photo you post on oh. Instagram, the Instagram would for have sure. significantly more views or reach. Yep. So I think the website is for people that are really into you, into your work, they can look at other things or they can... And they want to see more. When both of us kind of started posting our bird photos, where was the place to be seen? Well. There was no Facebook really, and there was certainly no Instagram or TikTok. Back then, you know, I think both of us really enjoyed taking part in these different 
photo website sort of communities and posting your images and you sort of knew all the other photographers and it was like, you know, pretty good comments where people would sort of like give you tips. And I know for me personally, I learned a ton from looking at other people's images that I really admired, but that only lasted so long because along came good old Mark Zuckerberg and his behemoth Facebook. And totally, I think while the forums were very nice, they were great for getting individual sort of image critique, they were obviously very limited in terms of the reach that you could get with an image. If you got like 20 yeah. or 30 comments and 400 people saw your photo, you did like exceptionally well. And this was the biggest draw of Facebook. You could post a photo, people could share it, things can go viral, and suddenly maybe a million people that never knew about you saw your photos. So it was crazy in the early days of Facebook. You post something and it would go everywhere. Facebook was the first ones to, you can like something and people, oh, I got a thousand likes on my photo and, and people started getting addictive. These apps started to also learn that, that people really like to get liked. And by the way, Glenn and I really like reach and like, so make sure to smash up that like button <laughs> down there. Nice, nice transition. <laughs> <laughs> Along came Instagram as well. That started off just for photographers to be different, very restrictive square format. That was something that stopped me from posting there for way too long. If I had, that would probably be one of my main regrets to say, I don't want to post to it's square format. It's stupid. What was stupid was me not being flexible enough to say I crop my images square because if you had started out much earlier, you'd obviously be much further along the track than now. But that became yeah. the big thing, not just for photographers, for literally everyone in the world. Everyone Everybody. had to be on Instagram and you had amazing yeah. organic reach for a while. Think back to when we were posting on those uh, forums. There was no such thing as like a content creator or a YouTuber or somebody who actually made a living from, from this kind of thing. That didn't exist. The, I guess the monetization and the ads is what enabled some of that to happen, but it also kind of kills the platforms. This is where I think YouTube found a very fair and nice model because everyone knows that the creators earn money with the ads. So I feel like people don't mind as much watching an ad here and there because they know it's directly supports the us. Like you watch our ads, we get a little bit of extra money. So it directly helps the creators. Whereas on Facebook, the majority of the ads just go into Facebook's pockets. So I think on YouTube, True. it's not, they've found a way to build a nice community where people can actually accept the ads. Of course, they're still annoying. If I watch a video, there's an ad in the middle of it. It's still annoying, but I know I'm actually supporting the person who made the video. So it doesn't feel as bad as some random sponsored post on Instagram that doesn't help anyone in any way, basically. After Instagram, it was TikTok. And I've literally never gone on TikTok. So I don't really have much to say about TikTok. So I'm gonna throw the mic to you, Yan, on this one. Well, it was quite addictive because it kind of fits into how our society runs at the moment. You don't wanna watch a three hour movie, just one funny video, another funny video, another completely different video, but it's still funny. So. When I started to just learn the platform, I often found myself suddenly like an hour or two had gone by and I'd just gone through like weird videos and stuff. So it's very addictive in that sense. And I think that's why it's so successful because I think people also spend a lot of time on the platform and time is money for these companies. So I think that's why Instagram yes. has this TikTok obsession with just making everything about reels and videos because video content is just what keeps people on the platform for longer. And that sort of attention is what everyone's striving for. So for me, TikTok is interesting, but I've never made it a priority. I've posted a bunch of videos there, but I haven't posted there in a while because I didn't feel like it was the best use of my time, essentially. I still wanted to yeah. be there. I still want to have a present because as we said previously as well, you don't want to put all your eggs in one basket. Like if I only focused on Instagram and they cut off my reach, what do I do then? So it's important to have your eggs in many different baskets, be on many different platforms. And I learned a lot about just watching other videos on TikTok as well. I got a lot of ideas. So I think even if you think it's stupid, you can still learn a lot about other creators, what they're doing. And if this is kind of what you want to do or you want to make your own videos, then just watching other people's videos is like a great way of learning and getting some inspiration. I don't think you have any Flickr account, do you? No. So I've always posted on Flickr, mostly because again, like, I prefer the layout. And I think like when I go to my Flickr page, I'm like, that looks nice. It's like a <laughs> walk down memory lane. You're like, 
oh yeah, I remember that shoot to Mexico. And oh yeah, before that I was in Colombia and this, and you just post, I wound up posting just five or 10 of my favorite shots from each trip. And so as you scroll down, it's just this nice kind of um, well curated bunch of shots and you can post them as big as you want. So I don't post them full res, but you could if you wanted to. And you can certainly post them a decent size. So again, if you want people to see the image sort of uncompressed at a good size, it's a much better place than somewhere like Instagram or Facebook. So for me, at the moment, at least Instagram is, well, YouTube is actually number one, but if I want to share my photos, then Instagram is still number one. Do you post on lots of different forms? Have you picked just one? What's your favorite? Where do you, and like we said, what are you looking to get out of social media? We'd really love to know, and maybe, who knows, maybe we can tailor our content to be more what you guys want to see. So let us know down in the comments. So talking about social media, Glenn and I went onto social media, in particular Instagram, went to our bird photo show hashtag and picked three photo of the weeks each for this week. So what's the first image you brought us, Glenn? This image really jumped out to me from, uh, again, pronunciation, I'm sorry, Norel Loader. Why I picked this one was I just really liked this sort of beautiful native, you might know what kind of plant this is, but it's a beautiful plant and I just thought it was a really a really nice image, but I do have some suggestions. What do, what do you think, Jan? I think it's a nice image. The plant is beautiful. Now you put me in a tough spot because I have no clue what plant it is, but maybe <laughs> one of you will know. But I think it's a really nice image. If you actually open up a levels adjustment on this image, I think you would see quite a gap on both sides of the histogram. So even just adjusting yep. the levels, brightening the images and bringing in a bit more punch would help it a lot because I think overall it looks like a cloudy day but with a few curves and a level you can actually make this give it a real punch and make it really stand out. I love the plant and the it's got a very strong sort of vertical line but if you look at the image and you if you drew a line right down the middle of it almost everything interesting in this image is on mm. the one side right there's like basically nothing on the left now of course we had to crop it for Instagram or whatever but if, if I was actually presenting this image I would go as you say tighter by making it a vertical crop and then yes some of your editing suggestions yes i think you know brightening the highlights and and opening up the shadows a bit mid-tone contrast and by doing that i think it would overall be an even better image so the first image i picked is one that would not normally stand out to me but for some reason it really stood out to me because the bird's a little bit covered by the leaves but i thought it gives it a really nice sort of foresty feel quite a lot of intimacy mm -hmm. and you have the three babies sticking out the head, which is obviously amazing. The parent, you have it there. And there's so much action going on with the bird's head. The bird's tail being covered almost doesn't matter. And I really just like the yeah. colors and I kind of like those sky elements shining through the leaves without being yeah. blown out. So that's done really well. It creates a mood, this photo, mm. because like you say, you feel like you're kind of in the photo or in the forest and it's, it's not like sort of, one of those sort of technically perfect photos, but it's also a photo with this moment and the three babies and the overall vibe of the photo that I think works really well. So when you go through all these photos, Glenn, what makes you pick an image? What creates a connection for you with a certain image when there's thousands, tens of thousands of images? I'm looking for ones that sort of have like really good technique and good processing where the images really feel like they're, they're processed well, they're popping off, you know, yeah. nice colors you know, um, the right kind of dynamic range in the final edited result. And I think this one that I've brought here from M. Jot Photography <laughs> from the Netherlands is sort of a good example of that. Like, they committed to this shot. They obviously got down low, you know, showing, like I said, that good technique, that distant background kind of blending out. We feel like we're at eye level with the bird. We've talked about a lot of this stuff where you're looking into the bird's eye and it's looking back at you. It's a nice, intimate, tight portrait of this of this shorebird. If you were up higher, if you had a sort of closer background, if the bird hadn't been processed well, then I think none of this, none of these, this image wouldn't work. But because it's been done well, I think it's a nice image. It's not like a super wow shot, but it's a very nice portrait of this red shank. I totally agree. And it's actually edited really nicely. It's not over the top, like it, the colors are not popping really like crazy on your screen, but you look at it and you see some nice soft light and it just looks well done mm -hmm. overall. My only thing would be the imaginary legs probably being yes. shopped on yeah. this one. So you could probably say 
maybe you can go a little bit less tight but i know with these shorebirds sometimes they just come to you so quickly and because the legs are submerged you can probably get away with it so you can see for glenn and me personally it's very important that the images are edited well and we have just the right resources for you if you want to make sure that your own images stand out we have our process where with just one click you can transform your raw files to a fantastic starting point and then i have my master class and glenn has some great photoshop ebooks where we teach you step by step everything you need to know in photoshop to make your own images stand out so if you're interested in these make sure to check them out down there in the description absolutely all right yan image number two what do you got for us the second image I brought is a little bit plain, but it's actually not that plain. It's just plain <laughs> because the bird's called plain parakeet, but I was instantly drawn to it. I think here I built a connection because whenever I see a parrot, I just have to click on it because they're my favorite. But I also saw a little bit of that awesome perch in the little thumbnail. And I thought, oh, that's mm. a cool bird. Yeah. That perch looks really cool. So I would actually like to see more of this perch. I feel like don't give me so much mm. sky above. Give me more of that epic purge yeah. below. I'm like, it's so nice. Shift Everything kind of matches nicely. There's different shades of green, but actually the bird still stands out from the green background as well. So I think it's done very well overall. The light's quite nice and I wouldn't change much on it at all. Some more brightness definitely wouldn't hurt because again, if you opened a histogram on this image, I'm sure there would be a gap on the right-hand side, which means... And again, I don't know if this is the case in this person's sort of like dig digital darkroom skills or whatever. But I think what happens a lot of times when people are processing their images is that the camera can only capture so much dynamic range and they want to make the overall image brighter. But in this case, for example, that little bit of its nose and maybe some parts yeah. of the branch maybe would have been getting too bright and people possibly aren't quite sure how to handle that where they can still make the overall image brighter but then just with a layer mask, just tone back those brighter areas. So this is why we, we really are constantly saying that you need to invest that time in the digital darkroom to acquire these skills so that you have the creative freedom to make your image look how you want to. So, you know, keep working away in the digital darkroom with the resources that we've provided so that you can really polish up those images to be the absolute best they can be. And that's a great point. For instance, I usually like to separate the bird from the background, make a selection for both so I can work like on the bird individually. For instance, if I make it brighter, I can then just brush just on the bird and bring back some of those highlights. But what's your yeah. final pick of the day, Glenn? Okay, well, my final pick is kind of a bit of a different style of image, not a tight portrait here. I really liked this painted bunting shot from Murali Hanab. And I just thought it was such a nice setting in this like, they're not thistles, I don't think, but some kind of beautiful sort of purple flowers with a nice sort of bit out of focus in the background and the bird is quite small in the frame, but it's just a, it's just a very pleasing image to look at from. I totally agree. Looking at it, it's beautiful. And lately I've been drawn to a little bit more wider shots as well. So I really enjoy this photo. I think this could also work as a vertical crop where yep. you still have some of the flowers in the background and the bird would be a little bit bigger, but I think overall it's done really nicely. But I do think as well, if we open the histogram on that image, again, you, there would be room to actually give it a bit more punch to make it stand out a little bit more. Totally. And yeah, I definitely agree. If this was like a pretty full frame shot, there's there's lots of options here. And sometimes you could even process an image twice, like yeah. go for this sort of wider, looser composition and then be like, well, maybe I'll make another version of this, a tighter vertical. And, and that could look really nice as well. But overall, Murali, great shot. Thanks for sharing it. Because this could also be a great magazine cover. If you actually had a little bit more space mm. above and do a vertical crop, I could totally see that yep. on a nice bird magazine. Yeah, that's a gr that's actually a great point. This is exactly the kind of shot that could wind up on, on the cover of a magazine. All right, Jan, last shot, last photo of the week for this episode. Let's see what Jan's brought for us. The third image I brought is right up my alley. It's certainly something that I would try to take as well. It's a nice perch with some nice lichens on it which actually make mm -hmm. it if that perch has nothing on it i think it might be a little bit too big but in this case with the green lichens on it or the moss it looks really nice you have a bird in a fantastic pose you see the nice orange really throat all the detail in there you see some orange on the tail and you have a beautiful bright background that adds to the image without distracting from the image so essentially a perfect shot for me there's really nothing i would change on it yeah, it's a great shot um, from Ali here. It does seem like some of those throat feathers could potentially use a touch of color or a touch of cloning in there. So maybe another case for 
for either just a little bit of cloning or a little bit of colorizing that layer just to, again, you know, what I think of when I'm processing these bird shots is I want, I don't want to go over the top and make it look like some fake bird, but I do want this photo to be the most pristine, beautiful example of this species that you have ever seen. So if I see little blemishes on a bird, I'm very, very often going to try to, 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 to repair those because it's not an, ex, it's not like an extrapolation of nature. It's, it is what the bird looks like. It's just the perfect specimen. That's kind of what I'm going for when I'm processing shots. It just takes it to an extra like 2% and people go like, wow, what a great Exactly. Thing. And that's a good point, that extra 2%. Sometimes what you might want to do when you're processing your images is get it to where you're finished, take a step back, go do something else, and then come back and look at it and go really try to evaluate it and think, is there anything else I might want to do? Now this can backfire too, because <laughs> sometimes people tinker, tinker with their photos so much that they do go too far. But maybe that's part of the art and sort of the learning process is trying to know when to stop and also knowing when you could just push it that little bit more. And again, the more skills, the more tools you have in your digital darkroom toolbox, the more control, the more ability you have to make those images amazing. I mean, look at this image you can see in my background here. There's probably like 25 layers open on the right hand side. And oftentimes <laughs> it's just a tiny curve to brighten an area next to the eye or darken something on the back or make the white throat a bit whiter because it had a funny color cast. So often it's very small things that we do, but then actually take that image to the next level. And oftentimes you wouldn't even realize what we have done, but it just looks more pleasant, nicer of all. And I think on that note, it's a good time to wrap up this week's bird photography show. We hope that all of you enjoyed it. And like always, we love to like, so give us a thumbs up for this video. Let us know all your thoughts in the comments and subscribe to the channel. And we will see you guys very soon. Bye. See you next time, guys.